What's up guys, it's your boy, new week, new video, Ruben. This is for my New York Knicks fans and these are always my favorite videos to do because I get to talk about my squad. And um, before I dive into it, you know, again, appreciate all the love. Remember to like, subscribe, share, keep rocking with your boy and let's just dive right in. We're, we're up 3-1. Cleveland, it's over, all right? Now, I expect their best shot next game game five in cleveland i did pick the knicks in six so i'm not going to be surprised if cleveland wins but i don't think the pressure and having to go back to new york and 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 uh i don't think cleveland is going to be live to, able to live up to that pressure i they might lose in cleveland in five um as a result of i kind of think we've snatched their heart from them and here's what i mean right and so let me talk about first Donovan Mitchell. I love Donovan Mitchell. I think Donovan Mitchell is a superstar. I called it before he got traded to Cleveland. Uh, I wanted him here just like the rest of us. I was not one that was willing to gut the roster and trade all those picks for him. Um, and, 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 and no lie, I didn't think there was a team out there that warrants us even thinking about it. Right. So the Cleveland move was a complete surprise um when you thought about like who has the picks and, and and the lack of contracts and yada 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 well cleveland swooped in there at the last minute good move for them but here's the thing that the issue i had with with donovan mitchell that i didn't want to talk about at the time because i was in the middle of the whole hype and euphoria of thinking about donovan mitchell in new york the problem with donovan mitchell is and while i think you can win with him um again i think he's a superstar but i also think you have to be built a specific way in order to do it because at the end of the day the teams that are going and winning the championships have superstars which i do believe donovan mitchell is one but they have um guys that can do things that are above and beyond in, in terms let, let me let me paint a better picture so when you have donovan mitchell and pretty much nobody else and you play a team like Boston, you don't think Donovan Mitchell might have a problem not only just scoring to keep pace, but like how hard is Donovan Mitchell going to have to work to score when he's being guarded by Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, like that, right? And, and then and then you're, you're you're looking at your Kawhis, your Paul Georges, your Kevin Durant, right? They're all huge wing type players, and so again. AI made it to the finals. He was a special dude, but that team was built specifically around Donovan Mitchell a certain way. That means you have to have your rebounders rebounding and blocking shots and playing big. You have to have your shooters shooting. You have to have that third. Um, I, I've always referenced like a third score. You have to have your second and third scores that are on point. Um, you have to be a very well-rounded team when you have a guy and you're building it around a Donovan Mitchell. Now, on its face, Cleveland has a lot of that stuff, right? Where I think they're failing is a couple things. Our big guy is out big manning their big, their two big men, right? So Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, when you look at them next to Mitchell Robinson, which I didn't realize Jared Allen was kind of as skinny as he was, um, but when you look at them next to Mitchell Robinson, even though Mitchell Robinson is seven feet, and I think Jared Allen is right, like an inch shorter, if, it, if that, he looks like a bigger man next to both of them. And he's dominating the offensive boards, giving us second chance opportunities. Not only that, but our smaller guys are getting rebounds. So case in point, we won the rebounding battle 47 to 33 in this last game. The game before, we won the rebounding battle by only three, but... When you look at not just the rebounding battle, we're turning them over. Um, and the defense, look at like their field goal percentage in their loss in game three uh, was 38.8% to our 47%. Their three point percentage was 21 to our 30. This last game, they had a better field goal percentage than us. But they were they shot abysmal from three at 26%. We weren't that much better at 27. Um, but 
We had a we had a few more um, free throws, and we dominated them against the boards, and then we made up the difference in total turnovers. So, where I think Cleveland's failing Donovan Mitchell is is ultimately coaching. Um, and here's what I mean by it. So, game one, it was you know what, kind of like boxing, a feel out round, right? Like round one, you're feeling each other out, and it kind of became an ISO fest, you know. Uh, Jalen Brunson was, you know, got in foul trouble, but then he came in and he went off. And that was after J Julius Randle went off in the first round and in, in the first half. Um, the second game where we got blew out, <clears throat> the adjustment was clearly make Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle work. They fed Evan Mobley offensively. They, um, and then whoever got, they, they were switching so that Jalen Brunson would get on somebody like a Karis LeVert who went to work on him. They were making him work defensively. And then on offense, they were blitzing pick and rolls. Um, they were double teaming him, right? And at certain points, they were making him, uh, they were playing him full court. Okay, so what is the adjustment the Knicks make, right? So they stopped doing the picks as much <clears throat> where I, you know, I, I think they could still be coached better with regards on how they handle pick and rolls because the second guy has to be ready to make the, the right pass. So, for instance, you pick with a Julius Randle. Julius Randle has to be able to zip that ball to whoever's not open because somebody has to rotate to Julius, right? And so that means for an instant, when you make that pass, somebody's either open or the you can get the hockey assist, so to speak, right? So you zip it to somebody real quick, the defense overreacts and leaves another person open, and that person has to whip it. Right. We're not doing a great job of that. And then defensively, we've been making them work like we've been uh, obviously the goal had been to shut down Donovan Mitchell. And if I'm J.B. Bickerstaff, you have to have a point guard do point guard things. And this isn't a knock on Darius Garland. I think he's a good player, but he's not necessarily needed to score. It's the, I think that's a plus. What they need is you got Donovan Mitchell to score. And if we pay him too much attention, yeah, Dar Darius Garland, you should get off. But where Darius Garland is failing the team is he's not playing point guard enough. And here's what I mean by that. So Isaac Okoro, going in, I've seen some Cleveland games. Isaac Okoro and Lamar Stevens had been a huge part of their rotation in terms of how they play defense and yada, yada, yada. Well, now <clears throat> we're playing them because we don't have to respect Isaac Okoro from three in the wing. We're playing them to make that pass. Well, J.B. Bickerstaff's reaction to that was to bench Okoro and, pay, and play Seti Osman. Well, the trade-off there is Seti Osman can't guard Brunson, which is where we keep ending up in switches where Seti Osman is on Brunson or if he, or actually he's the primary defender on Brunson because you don't want Garland or Donovan Mitchell on him, right? And you don't want to put Evan Mobley or Jared Allen on him. So that means your, your small forward, so to speak, has to guard Brunson. That's Seti Osman. Well, on offense, well, obviously he can't guard Julian Brunson. On offense, he has to be able to hit that shot from the wing. And what I'm seeing is a couple times he's not posting up where Isaac Okoro and Lamar Stevens would be in the corners. And Darius Garland's not getting into the lane enough to force the rotation to allow that kick out to the corner. They're, they're, they're playing right into our hands. Now, I'm not trying to say that we're not the better team. I firmly believe we're the better team. Mitchell Robinson is a, the, big, the better big in terms of doing big man shit, in terms of rebounding, blocking shots, deterring everything, and, 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 and making sure that the game is played from a jump shooting place. Mitchell Robinson is doing his job. Julius Randle is supposed to be the offensive threat that, that that's going to terrorize Evan Mobley, which kind of takes him out of what he does, right? Because Evan Mobley doesn't want to be playing on the perimeter. But the problem is Julius Randle has now hit a cold streak, and now Evan Mobley's starting to get confidence. Now not only is he playing defense, but he's scoring, which brings me to my man Julius Randle. So that concludes kind of how I feel about Cleveland. I think they're coaching – um, I don't think J.B. Pickerstaff is the is the worst coach, but he's not doing a good job in terms of adjusting appropriately, in my opinion. You haven't even seen Lamar Stevens that much, right? And the reason for that is he doesn't want to give up the shooting. 
He feels like Shetty Osman gives them the third shooter. Uh, him and Karis Levert, they're getting plenty of reps. I, <laughs> I think, I think he's playing too much into our hands. And 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 I mean, I guess when you look at the box score and you go, "Damn, we're not scoring at all." Um, how can I put non-scores in the game? I would, I would say to him, "Well, New York's not scoring great either. Outside of Jalen Brunson, we're not doing a great job of scoring." We're not. Julius Randle is in a hell of a cold streak. And before him, it was R.J. Barrett. R.J. Barrett's bounced back with huge games in MSG. And, um, I mean, I <laughs> thank God. Thank God. All right? Because R.J. Barrett, I'm in a weird place with R.J. Barrett. I've never loved him. And I, I just don't understand what he does in the offseason that he's so incapable of shooting the ball, the basketball. Um, he's an okay spot up shooter, but in terms of driving, like game series like these, I expect to be nightmares. I, I expected him to um, suffer the way he did in that he's not a great finisher going to the basket because he doesn't have a great layup package. And what I mean by that is, it's like when you see him drive against bigger guys, he he doesn't. It doesn't look like he tries to drive to draw contact. And, and, and finish strong. It's like he wants to avoid the con he can't have it both ways. He wants to avoid the contact and throw it up. And it leads to real inaccurate shots. It, it, it's shots that aren't in his bag and don't have a prayer of going down. And it causes a problem. Somebody got in his ear the last couple of games and clearly have told him, stop doing that. Stop fading away, number one, because that's not your game. Stop shooting mid-range, that's not your game. And if you're going to go to the basket, go hard to the basket, expect the foul. Like, play for the foul, stop worrying so much about whether you're going to make the shot or not, because you can't have it both ways. you got to commit. And that seems to be what he's done, at least the change that he's done the last couple games, and it's caused him to build up confidence, and now you see what's happened. Flip side, Julius Randle has fallen off a cliff. Um, and this is, and, and this year I had kind of came off the let's trade Julius train because we went ahead and got rid of Cam Reddish and it looked like we were going to, you know, go with the more veteran laden kind of team with the signing of Brunson and Hartenstein. And, um, and, and, and I knew Brunson was going to help out Julius Randle a lot and Julius Randle bounced back, but he's really got me against the wall on the. We might have to get rid of Julius Randle again, right? And that's because he's the ultimate head case. When the game doesn't flow through him or things are not going well, he's a powder. I Like, that's just not New York. He, he'll pout and it tanks his game. If he's not playing with confidence, he's an ultimate liability. And then he just stands around. We had a 15-point lead at one point, and it evaporated. And a big part of the reason it evaporated was he flat-out stopped playing defense. He was letting every cutter get off and get easy buckets. He was letting his man score. He wasn't doing literally anything. There were too many times he was standing around allowing things to happen. And when you're not scoring, that is unacceptable basketball. And I, I've always liked Julius Randle. I've always said this. I like Julius Randle. The problem is, is you have to play a specific brand of basketball with Julius Randle. And where I thought we would become more of a half-court team, uh, Josh Hart plays at the pace that I've been begging this team to play at. Uh, we are getting transition buckets. You remember when we used to, when when the the whole thing about trading Julius Randle was because let the kids play because we play with so much energy. We get out there, we run, easier buckets are made, and yada, yada, yada. Well, when Julius Randle's in there, he's done a better job throughout the season, but the ball tends to stick with him, and he slows the pace down. And when he's out there playing with those guys that are trying to zip and run, he's not in position to make a play, and he's not running with everybody. And it's, and it's costing us because now he's not even playing defense. And, and, and it's clear it's in his head. I mean, that's all I got for now, but Julius Randle better bounce back or this is going to be problematic going forward. I didn't expect him to go to the finals, but if we meet, match up with the Heat, you never know what could happen, man.
Remember to like, subscribe, and share. Let me know what y'all think. Go New York. Peace.